Hello and welcome to The Miked Up Show. This is season three, episode six. This one I am excited about. We've had a, a great lineup and we have another great two months coming. We have leadership, a lot of CEOs of IMBs. Um, and then in September, we have just for you, Michael Zhao, we have it going to be secondary month because, and we'll get into it, but I actually predicted, and I'll tell you why later, that September was going to be the month of the cut. And it goes to show with no, you know, with throwing a dart at the wall, a little bit of gut is just as powerful as working for CNBC. But since that seems to be the month they are going to cut, and I said that back in December, and I'll tell why, remind me why later, because that seems to be the month we're going to have a lot of secondary people lined up. But we were fortunate enough, and I am so excited for our guest today, Dane. Uh, but before we start, anybody who wants that's listening to us now on Live Nation, Spotify, Google Play, Apple Podcast, Amazon Podcast, if you're listening to us on our YouTube station, we are one of the few shows that allows guests Long-time listeners become first-time callers and, and really comment on our live show, which is always, which it is now, 2 p.m. Eastern and... Of course, and 11 a.m. Pacific in sunny San Diego. So there you go. So here we are live. You're welcome to comment. We'll be reading the comments if any, if any come. We're always encouraging it. But today we have Dane Herring, who has one of the most fascinating backgrounds in, in mortgage. Or we rarely actually say to a person on this show, which is very unique, like, tell us about yourself and what do you do and where you come from? We usually just hit the ground running and get right into it, which is interesting. But Dane is has an astrophysicist background, right? So I believe you're going to hear a lot of takes from somebody that very few people are. I think that's what stands out to me about that. You know, um, Number two, he worked for Steve Jobs. So as people know, I created the, the mobile app space in mortgage. And I worked from the borrower, just like Steve Jobs watched all that, right? Like um, borrow and work your way back to the technology. Ended up not winning out because the real customer ended up being the loan officer, which makes this a, a wacky space we are in. But we're going to talk about it. He also created um, Dorado, which is technically a, at the time a fintech SaaS play, one of the first of its kind. But we all know it now as really the acronym LOS that was, if not 80% all of the top 10 lenders were on at one point. So a lot of background there that's relevant today because everybody wants to get off their LOS, right? Loan officers, are they still the customer? Could be, maybe not. And then um, just from having a unique background is his ability to see dynamics and marketplaces. We, we were having actually dinner uh, two nights ago, and we were talking, we talked about it on our show, Michael, but the NAR settlement coming up here on August 17th, it, like nobody's talking about it. So I thought it would be kind of cool to ask you the question, Dane, and maybe you can take both sides, you know, to reveal what side you're on, but introduce yourself, say hello, but then clearly segue in our real, how big of a thing is this NAR settlement going to be to marketplaces and ecosystems? Yeah, and I won't talk too much about the NAR settlement. I'll, I'll talk about a little bit about the changes going on, you know, in the way uh, in retail lending and in, uh, you know, even a third party lending. We'll talk about that. Yeah, how would I word that then? Because I guess like coming up, like the settle, like that thing's already passed. So I guess starting in August, um, just rules, I think there's certain rules that need to change. Is that is that a better way to say it? Well, I mean, the way, the way you buy and sell things has always changed. It changes every day. The way I buy a book has changed and and what forces that change are all kinds of things, right? So uh, it could be just good luck. So, but it is it is changing. The way uh, somebody buys a house right now and the way that is going to change. And I don't think that's probably done, but let me give you, let me give you a little bit of my background. You already kind of stole my thunder on that, but how I got, it would be like, you know, sometimes I remember, you know, about five years ago, I was wondering how the heck I got here. Um, and, uh, I, I, I don't know. I, you know, my background is astrophysics. I was wor working at PhD and, and did get the master's on, and, and then as somebody came into my office and, and, uh, at school, I was at my TCLA, which is in California, as you know, Michael. And, um, I, uh, this guy comes, I was just getting ready, just done. And, uh, and you know, uh, 
making nothing eight hundred dollars a month, I think. And and uh, uh, this guy comes into my office. He looked like one of the Muppets with the 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 guy with the, he he plays with Beaker on the Muppets and the scientist. He comes in with the glasses on. We talk a little bit about it. He says, "Would you like a job?" I said, oh, and he hands me a number and and. I, I took the job and, and without even, that was the only conversation I had. And then through a series of events, I ended up in Washington, D.C. and uh, in the um, um, Saving Western Civilization. I was in the spy satellite community, uh, which back then I couldn't even tell my then wife uh, the acronym of where I was. Uh, but it was, and now you can buy a coffee mug there. It's called the NRO, National Reconnaissance Organization. Who supplies all the spy data? Spy and now to be a spy, you want to you want to go you want to go spaceboard to be a good spy. And uh, back then, uh, back then when I was doing it, it was Tiananmen Square. We were we were watching, and I couldn't really talk about it. But seeing you know, if you go, if you you went in, so you had to get all these clearances. It took about a year to get the clearances, and and they if, and they have to take lie detector tests. And the lie detector tests, they're looking for two different. There are two different types of lie detector tests. I'm getting off on a tangent here, so bring me back in. But one is uh, what they call just uh, you know, are you a communist back then? Uh, lie detector test, and one is what they call a lifestyle. And what they're doing on the lifestyle is looking for any way to that you could get blackmailed. Uh, so the idea is, so they ask you questions like. Um, you know, have you ever stole anything? You're, you're hooked up to these wires, right? And this guy, and this is between you and your career. You waited all year, you know, to get this. And, uh, I said, well, no, I don't, I don't steal. Well, you, you never, never, you know, taken a hanger out of the, uh, or a towel out of a hotel. Well, you know, that's true. I have done that. You know, I took a couple hangers by mistake and I did take a towel. And he says, so you're telling me right now that you just lied to me. A government official. Uh, well, I guess I just did. Well, you did. And then he goes, so um, you have to t- you, you take, you, at that, th- oh, I think it's probably still true. You, you put uh, your hours on a little car in front of your door of your office. And he says, well, ha- he knows exactly what to ask. He says, uh, well, have you ever put the wrong hours on? Have you ever left early from work? He says, no, I, I, no, I, I work a full eight hours, if not more. You know, I work a lot. And he says, uh, you never left early, like maybe to go to your daughter's. Well, I did leave early to go to my daughter's birthday party. And, but I came all the more early the next day, was right write down that day. I wrote down eight hours. So you falsified a government contract. Is that what you did? And that's, it just kept on going pretty soon. You're crying, right? Just to get into this thing. And, and they keep on looking, you know, it's not like, are you lying? They're looking for, well, they're trying to get you to. How can somebody, like I said, blackmail you? They're not looking for a friend of you. They're looking for an enemy, somebody who can give you some, somebody who can give them. It, back then, I think it might be still true uh, that if you say you and your wife are going to marriage counseling, you're done. You're out of the, you're out of the picture on that. You know, so, so it's very interesting then. And so I got into there and then we were building, there was 3,000 people over there. The internet was just getting out. Um, the web and most people were just using their PCs on their desktops to do, um, uh, email back and forth and, and they wanted to do something better. They wanted to share data all over the world. And so we put together the first, very first, I think government internet, it was a closed internet. We went back and forth to DARPA, we went back and forth to uh, MIT, and then you needed a Unix box. And the only Unix box out there were, uh, were HP, Sun, Microsystems, we remember those names. And then also, uh, and then Steve got kicked out of Apple, as you remember, he started a company called Next Computers. And and the operating system, which is on the, the Apple, the current Mac now, came out of CMU, and that was it was a Unix, and that's what you needed. And and he could you could a user could actually I mean you could actually use just like the Mac you could use uh, this uh, machine where you couldn't use the you know HPs and and the, the Suns. So the you know, you had to be a you had to know what you're doing. You had to be an engineer to do that. And these 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 people were engineers. So we bought 40,000 of those things and deployed them all over the world over this internet. You could walk anywhere you wanted to and there's your desktop. It just blew everybody's mind. We were very widely successful, deployed it, stay around. And then uh, Steve recruited me and I ended up working for him. That, that took me to Silicon Valley. Who was the target customer if there's only 40,000 of them? Is that government or is that just really wealthy or? No, so we, I, I was, the, because I was in a, I was the lead architect on this thing. I, I was very young. I couldn't even, I was, I couldn't even shave really. And, and, uh, 
I think my suit cost me about 30 bucks, you know, at Sims and when I met Steve and, and, uh, the, I, but at the same time I would get, so the way it works is you get a, uh, there is a one page security report, one page, uh, that goes, uh, which is that day security threats. And it would go to us first, um, a, a selected because we wanted to, um, we wanted to, uh, you know, th- we had to prepare and then went to the vice president and then goes to the president, right? And you needed to anticipate what the president might say. It's like, I want you to, by looking over, for example, Biden, Benjamin, uh, Tim and Shkwek, the you know, what, what's going on over in China. So we had to start looking at that and, and prepare, start knowing, because it'd take us two or three hours to get the satellite over there. And, and that was, so it was, it was, it was really national security. The customers, so the customer the customers were, uh, you know, freedom, democracy. I don't know. Yeah, that was the customer. <laughs> but, uh, and, and everybody, I mean, you know, and then there's obviously treaties and stuff like that. And back then also it was, uh, it was an act of war to take down a satellite. It was an act of war to t- because telemetry, you couldn't, you couldn't encrypt it, uh, fast enough because just you're taking beam up and down to a satellite. So, so it was just an act of war if you manipulated through telemetry, uh, you know, your adversary satellite, anybody's satellite back then. Now there's satellites all over the place, but this is back in the day. And then, uh, so Steve came, up, came out with his next computer and it was called, he called it interpersonal computing from personal computing. So he saw the, the power of the wide area network and, and kind of capitalized that, that back then, um, People were really using the internet as we are right now. We, I, like I said, I really do think we were the first commercial internet, not, well, not commercial government internet, and I don't think there was a commercial internet then. So I'm very proud of that. And then, uh, so then, uh, then I uh, worked for Steve. Then had a software company that got bought by, by Eric Schmidt over at Sun Microsoft. Eric was the he was in charge, but they just came out with Java. So again, I'm continuing this this internet life, and uh, I was I put I went from well, more the architect technology side, uh, you know, science side. I went to sales and marketing side and there I did market development, sales development for Java that we see all over the place. And there you were trying to get into the enterprises and, and, uh, we saw the value of it. And so it was our job to make it ubiquitous. So again, uh, we did, and, uh, my focus was on telco and, um, and financial services. And that's how I got here because our big customers then were were customers on the trading floor, customers, uh, uh, Fannie Mae was a customer. And so we, we went there, Fannie Mae was a big customer over at Next Computers as well. And so that's introduced me to the market. And I saw the opportunity for using the internet and the web to distribute. I saw, what I saw it was that everybody was taking a, a file folder with a lot of post-it notes and moving them from desk to desk to desk. So a processor does one function I always look at credit, you know, credit scores. I always, I always do this. I always do that. And so they, they take this workflow. The workflow is just somebody walking from a desk and taking another little folder, walking to the desk, go over Wells Fargo, those boxes of manila folders. So I saw the opportunity. What, what to, year is this, this now? This huh. Uh, 93, I want to say. Okay. Cause I heard a big, um, innovation back then around this time that you're talking transformational innovation was credit reporting agencies would actually have a small slope. Um, and I won't make any slope, uh, roof jokes right now, but had a small slope and the, they would have men or women with roller skates on. And that's how they had, that's how they became more efficient because they would roller skate around and grab these credit reports quickly and be able to mail it. So I think, you know, computer innovation wasn't, wasn't the big, wasn't the big piece right around the, the early nineties, but you needed credit to get a loan. So continue as my, well, yeah, you need to get credit and the credit would sell you a document. They wouldn't sell you a credit score. If you remember that too. So you had to get the document and the document had to be faxed to you. It could not be a, a, a credit score like you can get right now. And, and, that they, and they refused to do that. They refused to do anything else, but give you that document because they wanted to maintain, they thought that was risk of their business model. Uh, and so they had, they had to get over that. Um, I think, uh, first American or core logic buying credit code was a big deal on that. But anyhow, it, so there was a lot, it was a very man, it was a lot of friction to the market. The friction is still here. And, um, that friction was mostly just paper and brick and mortar friction. So it was kind of your classic friction. 
And that's when the book customers.com came out and they kept tried to come up with banks that were going to be just web only, et cetera. Wingspan was a bank. The banks kind of failed on that. And, and, but we were going to gang about serves and, and more customers, but that, that then was about maybe five, 10%, just get started to get customers on the internet, uh, putting their application on the internet. And also what was interesting that we found was customers are more willing to share information. They, they like the, uh, the anonymity of, of not being there in, in person to talk to a loan officer, Hey, what's wrong with your credit, you know, and, or, you know, uh, you know, where'd this number go? Look at your big statement there. You bought too much wine. Uh, you know, you know what I'm saying? I, I don't know. I don't want to, but so they like that. So they like being online, but then that application just went to, uh, you know, to a loan officer. And so we had at one point, we had about 40% of, because the market was very, uh, consolidated. We had about uh, 40% of all the transactions are, are, are it was us and LMA. And as L- LMA came from the brokers top uh, bottoms up and we were, we had, you know, the, all the big name brands, which I don't have their approval to say, but we had, it, we had 10 of the top 10. But then. Wow. That's how I got here. <laughs> I, <don't, laughs> I can't even balance my checkbook, but I got here. <laughs> so last year I, um, you know, my service is really introducing, um, or introducing different vendors. And I was working with SAP who wants to get into the, the LOS space. And what I noticed more than anything is people in this industry right now in this moment would love to move LOSs. Won't speak about from where or to where, uh, even though on the show, I have no problem doing it, but for the sake of maybe getting a better answer from you, I won't mention any names. What would you recommend to a leader that's thinking of changing an LOS and how would it be different now than back then on, um, well, you know, what, what they should be, the reason they should be doing it, their driver, their motivation, are they doing it just to do it? Or do you see a change coming where they should be thinking differently about their LOS? Well, I mean, uh, there's so many things to say and, and, uh, I don't know, you know, I can't see my audience, right. You know, their eyes, so I don't know which is going to work. Which is not. We're going to clip it up. So some great sound bites, you know, that we could send off the leaders. Is I, I will say a lot of the things are still the same. So, so in, in our space, um, it's not like you're going to buy a car, not like you're going to buy a TV where the design pattern of that particular thing you're buying is well established in the market. The concept of a loan processing system does not exist. It's something different for every single person. And so to buy something, to think you're going to buy something uh, that is tried and true and, and uh, what they call hardened, um, I, I, you gotta be very careful. And I know about 10 new uh, low, you know, companies that are starting new loan processing systems. And so you gotta know really what you're trying to solve, right? And and um, and just be careful. And if I had an existing loan processing system, I probably, the first thing I would do is try to, try to carve as much out, keep that there and carve as much as I could out into other things. Like for example, pricing is a, a, a you know, a clear opportunity for that because pricing should be single and uh, centralized, not into a loan processing system. And there's other opportunities as well. Obviously, for example, most people use a loan processing system and you had to use the uh, uh, direct to consumer interface of that loan process is this, you don't have to do that anymore. Um, so you can, you can cleave that off and then you can cleave off your integration layer and you can cleave off the, uh, you know, your underwriting system, your automated underwriting system. And then other things are just web services. So you're going to go get your, you know, get, get your credit scores and you get this and, and pretty soon it's just a small case, it does case management and it does, what does it do? It does, um, uh, compliance. Those are the two things it really does. But it, you know, replacing your system of record is a big deal, right? And so you need to plan around that. And uh, it's not for the faint of heart. So your uh, best thing to do is try to avoid replacing your system of record or gently move from one system of record to another one. That's the key. You have a system of record, what the, tech, the technology on top of it, whatever the software product you're using, doesn't really matter. And then you have all these key aspects, these key services that you need to drive in. And then you need, you need, when you're doing that, you also need to make sure uh, and, and be, you know, watch me and make sure I don't overstay a, a particular question, but you have to watch, you have to make sure you have guaranteed delivery on some of those services you provide. For example, what happens if the credit company that you're getting your credit scores from goes down for two, th- three days? You're, you're host as a business, right? You have to think about where's my backup? What's my backup? What are the SLAs? You got to think about, you're thinking now in terms of what are my SLAs and what is my 
mean time of failure for all these services. And there's a lot of services that are go into make it alone. It's a very distributed process that people have tried to do inside their own firewall and it didn't work. It was just a very natural transition into what they call back then web services, but a distributed, distributed manufacturing process is really what it is. That's outstanding. I, I don't know, Mike, if, if you have a question. I did actually. So as we're talking about the LL, uh, the loan origination system, and if the, lo if the LOS is the vehicle, then sometimes it's the parts that are the issues. You know, we talk about like um, credit reporting or credit uh, companies, you know, whether it's, uh, well, without leaving, leaving the names out, you know, there's lots of vendors that are out there that are providing credit services to an LOS. So then does it make a difference on the, on the vendors that you're using that are going through the LOS? so that um, and maybe it's not the LOS at all. Maybe it's the vendors that you're using and the ancillary services that co come in between. It, so is the, is the problem the vendors or is the problem the LOS? But probably there's a lot of problems. These lenders come from different uh, backgrounds and some of, them, some of them are dinosaurs, some of them are new and up and coming, right? And, and uh, uh, something that has, I'll give an example that has nothing to do about the service they provide, but uh, I had one very large customer that was losing Let's use the word, let's use the number $20 million a year, just in the difference between trying to bill for that service. And they couldn't get an accurate re accounting of how many services that my loan officers asked for and how many did I really order. And the number was always wrong and they couldn't, they couldn't reconcile that. So just even the, the order management of that that vendor was, was very difficult for them and, and a huge, with huge business outcome, independent of your manufacturing process, if that makes sense. So there's a lot of reasons to really look at your vendors. So you get a vendor, you know, I personally, I would do, I would use my vendors based on what's called the SLA, service level agreement, or really your expectation of them delivering service to you much more than if I save a, you know, a half, a, you know, 50 cents here or there, that, that wouldn't matter to me. And so I, you know, lend a uh, service providers I can, I can trust. And, and then I have to think about where are my backup and then everything else would be a backup uh, for that. And now the loan processing system, where the loan processing system is going to go down is on the, the problems going to be on, on scalability and, um, you yeah, know, just bugs with the, you know, the rule, a lot of workflow, a lot of, a lot of, uh, these loan processing systems are. Workflow systems that are rules driven, and those rules. It's very. Um, uh, I haven't seen a lot of anything really new, but there is a couple new. And I don't want again. I'm not like call one app versus the other. You guys are being careful not to do the same thing. I'm not pitching anybody, but the you know you get to an end end tier system key, and then you try to look at those rules. As you don't want to put too much into it. You don't want to put too much intelligence into the rules. Because taking it back out when a rule changes is almost impossible. And as we know, in a highly, highly regulated market, those rules change all the time. And so you need to really think about the rules that's driving my workflow. That's I need to go get, get one more document. Um, conditions change all the time. So I need, I'm looking at how those rules are maintained. And if they're maintained in just one table, uh, it becomes very, very cum cumbersome. And so those are the things you look for in some of the new technology that's coming out. I, I want to reference something that you said at the uh, at the beginning of the show is that one of the, you said uh, you know what is your customer your customer's freedom and then uh, and then uh, a few minutes ago you you mentioned that you know maybe you're not looking at saving money but you know what basically you're if you're a, an independent mortgage banker or even a mortgage broker so maybe you're not look maybe you are especially right now you know everybody's tr uh, doing the best they can to reduce their expenses. Um, but you know, what is the freedom that they are losing? You know, when, when the, when a company is willing to pay a little bit more, maybe they don't take freedom into consideration. They're always looking at the bottom line, but not necessarily looking at the value of freedom that they're purchasing. So, you know, what, what do you think is the freedom that they would be looking for in security, uh, not just in uh, efficiency, but security in, in the services that they have? Um, what are certain what are what are certain questions that you that that a owner of a broker or a banker should be asking themselves so they can buy that freedom for their company? Okay, well, I I do have an answer to that. So um, uh, we we used to when I entered this market a while ago, 
uh, not to age me, but uh, a while ago, we used to call them borrowers, kind of like your your brother-in-law who wanted a couple hundred bucks, right? He's going to give you that money back. And and which we kind of, you know, borrowers are very disparaging and we treated them like borrowers now. And the huge thing in anything, you, anything that you're doing in business, I don't care what it is, anything now that focuses on the consumer. And if you're not, if you're not consumer focused, I don't, I don't, just, if you're, if you're focused on your manufacturing costs, then you are a 1980s dinosaur. You, you should not be doing this. You should not be doing business. You should go to go work for government. You go find a, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's uh, you know, um, driver's license uh, departments that could really use those type of people. But the, the people that are really customer focused, that want that customer to be the happiest, you cannot, there's a great book by George Sewell. He was a Cadillac dealer out here. And he looked at that Cadillac, the person coming in for a $20,000 Cadillac. And he looked at that customer as a uh, million dollars over the lifespan of that customer. And he has this book called Customer's Life. Everybody should read that book. Because if you look at it, not as a transaction, the customer, but as an annuity, no matter what, an annuity, then that's how you build your personal wealth. And it's not, it didn't matter. I'll give an example, one example from the book that I remember. And I read that book about 20, 30 years ago, uh, you know, and I can still recite this story. I'm going to tell you that a customer came in, bought a Cadillac, um, um, uh, a couple came back a couple months and said, Hey, the trunk smelled, opened the truck. The guy, I went hunting and put some ducks in the, the trunk and forgot about him. So George, George Sewell, I mean, Sewell gets, you know, the, the, his, his dealership gets the, things, gets new carpet in the, the trunk, gets the smell out of that, gives the guy back, didn't charge him a cent. That guy's buying Cadillacs for his mother, ships him over there. He's buying Cadillacs for the entire family. That guy, that one $20,000 uh, transaction tr and that free service that he wasn't thinking about what's the cost of this service. So it wasn't. And that turned into a million dollar annuity stream, just that one customer. Right. And that one act, not, not looking at the, not looking at the cost of a toothpick, but let's to look at the profit of boxes and boxes and boxes of, of toothpicks I'm going to sell over time as an example. You know? That's a great example too, because the process of buying a car around, around here, they have the commercial shop us last, you'll love us. They even trademarked it because you really don't have many options once they leave that dealership rarely do they come back, right? So it's a full scale sale process that takes about a day. Because even when you buy it, they keep you in there even if you want to get out of there. So that's it. Just like lending, you know, we have all these vendors out there, but the actual process is 30, 60, 90 days. But loan officers are constantly relying, say, on their CRM to give monthly updates, not very personalized usually, except, you know, your your data field variables. Maybe the, I know we're getting a little bit better with CRMs, but it used to be clean your gutters, which isn't very relevant to the personal touch like you're talking about here at the dealership. You know, how you doing? How your kids? How's college? How's your birthday? Do um, you think that's all backwards now? Because it, it like do because it is a transactional business, do you think this, the vendors that are not familiar with the mortgage industry come in with these solutions that just don't really match what the customer as a homeowner wants for interaction from their loan officer short term? It's a complex transaction. There is a huge difference. And we think about this transaction as being just a financial transaction. It's not. So there's a huge difference between getting a credit card and doing this. And you talk about two, three orders of magnitude in terms of volume. So the CRM that you need, you know, there's only a, how many million in this? So there's 300, I don't know how many households. I think there's 80 million households and how many transactions this year will be about 6 million, right? So, you know, it's just, a, it's just 10% of, of those homeowners or no, let's not even that 5% of homeowners are changing hands at any one time. You don't need a, you don't need a very sophisticated CRM for that, right? What you need to do is, is, you know, if I think that now this is Dane thinks this, I'm not going to cite a book on this, that. Um, we're going to see a change, the same change that we saw in the travel industry, the same, th same change we saw in the car industry and the same, same, um, uh, same, same change that we is being forced on the real estate, uh, business, uh, real estate, uh, brokerage. We're going to see that in the, the buying and selling of, of home residential loans as well.
And that, that means that I think that that transaction mentality is going to change to a concierge mentality. And I, it could, that might even possibly or will uh, affect the way we are thinking about that transaction. Do I think about uh, motivating uh, my loan officer as a transaction, uh, as my transaction funnel? And I know, every, I know a lot of lenders, a lot of CEOs, and they all look at, it's all 80, 20, 20% 20 of the loan officers are doing 80% of the business. That's it. And if you want to hurt, you know, they all compete. And if I can get two or three of those top 20 of loan officers from my competitor, I'll bring them over here and wine and dine them and I'll get them over my company that goes back and it's 20% to 80%. That's in transaction. That means that other 80% of the business they're overpaying for. And I think people like this topic. And I think the travel agent is really, really relevant, not just for borrower experience, but there's only six airlines, let's say, maybe seven, two are budget. Southwest, you can't get on Google, so you have to actually search Southwest. But you, it doesn't take very long to know the landscape of how to know all the prices, and then you can go and try and get overlay VIP experiences from Expedia. Just like in lending, and Jeremy Potter talked about it, does it go to three layers? Jumbo lending, Fannie Freddie, which is those airlines, right? And the, it, do you necessarily need a person like a travel agent to do the airlines or do Fannie Freddie? And then down here, you have unique niche products. Can you, can you talk about when this first happened back in the travel agent days and Expedia first came out, do you think the travel agents could have done anything leading up to it to prevent people from shopping the way they do? Or do you think it was just an industry that was um, destined to be disrupted by what I just described? Well... Uh, and I'm, I want to make sure everybody knows as listening, you know, I'm not that old, but this happened in my lifetime. Okay. In my adult lifetime, uh, when I can afford an airline ticket and the, you had, you did go through a travel agent and you got a number and that number was usually an even number or not an even number, but it was a round number. You know, you didn't know what the airline ticket actually cost and you certainly didn't know what the travel agent was getting, making on that. And you didn't even know who was the most efficient way to get there. All you know is you got a ticket. And if you lost that ticket, you, then you started to cry and get another ticket or whatever. It's all paper based. So that, and what happens is that the travel agents understood their power on that. And they tried to come up with their own, uh, automated system that they would all reside on. The travel agent system was called that. I forgot the name of it. And, uh, so the travel agents were already intermediating the airlines and the airlines saw the risk of them consolidating, unionizing, if you will, on, on the same platform that the, the airlines would be commoditized, right? So they came up with their own system and that they all, the airlines put in hundreds of hundreds of millions of dollars each, and they all came up with Saber and Saber was that reservation system still in there today. And they call that a global distribution system, which is kind of what we use here. So you can get a ticket anywhere and you could also, it also manages the compensation anywhere. And then, so then that's going on, but now Sabre became itself the, 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 you know, the, became the monster because now they're getting disintermediated by, or intermediated, I should say, by Sabre itself. So Sabre comes out with the Orbis, came, comes out with this, and they're getting, once again, they're, they're at risk of getting commoditized. And so this just happened in the, this was just in the Wall Street Journal saying in the last uh, five, 10 years, um, where they competed against, so Sabre was competing against American Airlines and because you were not, they, they didn't like you, the ability for you to go directly to American Airlines and get a ticket, understand what the cost was. And so they were competing against each other and American Airlines basically broke the union, if you will, and now you can go, you compete uh, directly. And why did American Airlines really, what they wanted to do that? One, they wanted to have a better experience for the customer, great, and they wanted not to get an intermediate but they also wanted to get the control of that consumer experience because they wanted to upsell other things, things like that's going to cost you luggage or things will get you, you know, would you like a, a hotel? They wanted to go up market and, uh, and that's why they, they won. And, and, and then the technology itself with the internet and, and your access to information that changed at the same time. So now everybody goes online. 
uh, to these these sites and and best execute themselves for you know what they can, how when do they want to get there how many legs they're willing to do and and do they have mileage etc. So the airlines can go up market in terms of the things they can provide or or uh, say look at Virgin Airlines say they can give you a better experience or they can they can uh, give you better mileage etc. Alaskan Airlines. And the, unless the travel agents, the one, the, the few travel agents that are, are making money went to that concierge service. They either do it for large enterprises. I got all your travel. Don't worry about it. I got it. It's a different number per transaction, but they're making money over the long haul, a lot more money. Or the concierge, hey, I'm going on a wonderful vacation. I want to I go take my wife to and my family down the, the Nile. Okay. I got, that's not easy for everybody. I got this. I'll go to that. And they get, it's not necessarily commission based. It's like, it's the same problem you have when you get an interior designer. I don't know what the price of the furniture costs. The interior designer tells me something. I know they bought it wholesale. That, that's, that is going, that is a dinosaur model that's going away. And it's going away. It's going to go, it has to go away in our market. There's too much. There has been an asymmetry of information, meaning the person buying the house has no idea about they just want the house. It's an emotional deal for them. It's the only, it's the biggest purchase they'll ever make. It's how they're going to build their wealth. And they don't care about these things. And I, well, they can't do it. Same, you see the same thing in healthcare. Well, that asymmetry of information is going away. The consumer is getting much more information. And there's a lot of regulations. So you can push more of that information forward to the consumer. And so that's going to get very, very hard. So that transparency is going to create uh, some changes in the way we buy it, we we sell loans, and 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 that relation, and the way we sell and buy houses is changing as we look at it this summer, and so then the relationship between that loan officer and the buyer side realtor is certainly going to get um, get stressed. I mean, that's not a that's not going to be a a go to way to get your leads for your applications. You're going to have to assume that they're going to come online or, or the, the company you're working for is going to get leads some other way. Yeah. Your analogy the other night um, at dinner about healthcare was eye opening to me because nobody asks the MRI price or because once you, you just think about your deductible and if it's over the deductible, don't even look at it. Mail me something later. Never ask. Sounds insane, but it's what all of us do. Same thing for buyers. They really didn't ask, like, okay, as long as the seller's going to, everybody else that's bidding on it's doing this way, sure, Tom, I'll sign it. Sure, Dane, I'll sign it. Now, I think what you're going to see is two things. One, I think consumers went to go see 15 homes because, and I didn't mean to interrupt you, Mike. One, I think what's not talked about enough, my take is, you just got a raise or you just got that new job where you went from making 80 grand to now you're making $140,000. You are so proud of that. You go down and you get qualified. You are actually going to, and your, and your real estate agent doesn't charge you anything more to go see houses. You want to show your wife like, or opposite wife shows the husband, you know, look, we're going to go see all 15 houses because I can, you're, you're not saying it out loud, but it's like, cause I can afford it now. I worked hard. I got that raise. Now, something as little as, oh, honey, um, each showing $75 plus we need babysitters. Um, why don't we go on, and then it's going to be, do we go on Remax or do we go on Zillow, which is even more disruption? Why don't we go on there and just, why don't we see three today? Because if I'm paying, that's 150 especially if you can't roll it in and they pull up in the car and they say, all right, do you want to go see five? And you're like, yeah. And they're like, okay, that'll be $425. And you're like, Actually, why don't we start with two, right? And so I think they're going to see a lot in the sales world. You know this, Michael's out. I'll segue to you to ask a question to Dane on what I just said. But they're going to get ghosted more. Like, yeah, sounds. I definitely want to work with you, Mike. I'll, I'll call you tomorrow because you're asking me, like, can you just write a check for? It's usually eight grand, right? Two grand now, and if the seller doesn't pay it, you could pay me the six grand before closing. Yeah, sounds great. It just. Let me check with my wife and we'll definitely do it tomorrow. And then you'll just never hear from me for a couple of weeks. And I'll say, oh, yeah, yeah, I got busy. That is going to happen in a month because that happens in every sale that requires somebody to pull out an actual checkbook. Um, I guess, what, what would your question to Dane be on what I just said? I was thinking more along the lines of right now, the mortgage industry has commoditized itself uh, to, due to 
price. And you know, one thing I, I appreciate, I mean, I remember the Sabre system actually in the late 80s. That's, that, 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 that age is me. <laughs> and, uh, but I mean, in, in the airline industry, in the travel industry, you have a uh, first class, business class, and then coach. Uh, but the mortgage industry has commoditized itself to where everybody gets, uh, or everybody is pr- supposed to get first class service while paying for coach prices, right? Yeah, but yet there's originators out there. Hey, maybe one originator knows more about taxes and financial services, and they're better, and they're a, they're more of a concierge uh, originator. And and the, maybe you can do it through an LOS. Maybe you're not able to do it through an LOS. I don't know. But I think that there there's there the, we really as an industry uh, shot ourselves in the foot. Right? It really should be. Hey, if you want to close a loan in seven days, you should pay more for that. And you get all this concierge service and you do this, hey, but it's more of a like, hey, I'll get you the lowest price and I'll close in seven days. And we, we, it's like, that's right. You kind of screwed up. Yeah. I was like, wait a second. I mean, why, why are we doing this to ourselves? We're, you know, we're sending our processors and our doctors and our underwriters to rush, 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 rush. And, and then, and we're taxing our systems more and more and more. Dane, I mean, you're, you're getting a PhD in philosophy and, and I, and, you know, and I know that you're, I think that, or at least I think that you're able to see what, you know, the forest through the trees. I mean, is there something we can do as an industry instead of reducing our profitability and providing better services? Why aren't we able to, and this is more of a philosophical question, why aren't we actually able to charge for the time and the energy and that service? instead of just saying we're going to get it done and lose money at the same time. It's just so weird to me. Um, But yeah, you know, if the airline system is able to do that, why isn't the mortgage industry able to do that? that, That's kind of rhetorical, but yet asking you at the same time. No, it's good. It's good. And you said philosophy. I'm going to bring up a, a, he's kind of a philosopher. He said he he studied a lot of philosophy and uh, but also psychology. And his name was Joseph Campbell. And he said, uh, and he said that all the religions, he was a PhD in this stuff. And, and, and Joseph Campbell said, uh, he said, uh, it's not about finding the meaning of life. It's about finding life with meaning, which, and that is what I'm saying is what is your reason to be there and doing what you're doing, right? If you're just a transaction cog, then, then yeah, you should be, wor- if you're just, if you're just a voice, then you should be worried about AI. If you're just. If you're just doing the manufacturing process, yeah, I guess uh, the steam engine should have, you know, that would have been wor- very worrisome. And now we're going on, it's it's going to be the, the customers and customers with a sh- very short, with a lot of opportunities to go elsewhere and a very short attention span. And uh, these are the same customers that uh, buy McDonald's through Uber Eats, right? Because they don't want to even leave the, the living room. So these customers don't want to even deal with the transaction. They don't even want to go to the restaurant. They want it to come to them. And so these customers are really um, learned on customer service and will pay for that. You know, a burger, getting it over Uber Eats is a lot more expensive than going out to McDonald's, right? And you've got to use that model to say, okay, what is my meaning? What am I doing? What value do I provide? And then go from there. And if, and yeah, it's not just problem low. It's just as, oh, here's a problem, you know, a borrower, you know, or a consumer that, you know, maybe has bad per- credit score. And I'm very good at that. I mean, look at the success of, of the, the, um, uh, the, uh, Hispanic real, uh, NR, uh, NH, NARA, excuse me, it was on my tongue. And, you know, because they provide a value, they provide a different value. They provide a value that you and I can't touch. I don't speak fluent in, uh, Spanish and, and, uh, and even then, and I'm not saying that's just the one way to go, but that, what am I doing here? They don't just speak the language, but they're building a trust with a, uh, uh, somebody who maybe doesn't trust, um, the, the businesses that they'd have to do business with. They're probably under bank. They're probably caught a lot of reasons why they're, uh, they're on, not trusting this transaction. And yet if we get them into a home, so many great things are going to happen. They're going to be better citizens, all this kind of stuff. So. These guys provide real value, and that's just on the real estate side. Okay, so now we talk about the lenders. Well, it is commoditized. It's always been commoditized, but it's been it's, the distribution is very hard. I, I used to, I used to go to a credit union to get a home loan, right? Yet you didn't even care. It's just there's you go to a credit union, and not that many people had houses. This is all post World War II stuff. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac came up, 
And so now it did become, for a very good reason, it became commoditized because this is the number one mechanism for people to build wealth. Unless they, they, you know, they, you can play the market, just put your money in there and get an index fund, you're going to make five, seven percent. You can buy a house, buy property, and you know that's going to appreciate. You might have bad pot times, you might have good times, but over a general, your property is going to appreciate five to seven percent on the year on year. Just your property, and if you buy it low, then you're you you're very uh, what do you call it? Um, you're very uh, leveraged on your your investment on the property. So it's a it's a it's a great opportunity for people to build wealth, and it's a great opportunity for communities because people who own their they're a little more responsible than I was when I was twenty years old living in the apartment. And so, yeah. If the, I'm going to ask you a chicken and the egg question. You know, Joseph Campbell was a direct influence to George Lucas uh, when he was getting ready to produce Star Wars. And so, you know, using a chicken and the egg question here, uh, who's the good guy? Who's the bad guy? Is it the customer that's the, the bad guy or is the customer the good guy or is perception the reality? In other words, the perception of the, the banker, broker or, or, the, or the consumer borrower. I mean, which, uh, which one is it? Which one is which using that as chicken or the egg scenario in your opinion? Well, my, my personal opinion, then I'll maybe I'll, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but I think that the, if I had, you know, as a family of four and, and, uh, you know, my kids, I had to put food on the table for my kids and, and, uh, and I only sitting on a little track house and I had to go make money. And so the person who had that money that I need to go make it from is the hero to me because I can provide some value to that person who has money and I can take that money and then buy some food for my kids. That's the way I look at it personally. So now I can't, I, you know, you're talking about what, what is the right now, I think, in service, I, I think you were talking about a multi-trillion. I mean, I just saw that Mr. Cooper has $1.5 trillion and, you know, on, on the books right now. Yeah. So that's a lot of money. There, that, there's not enough money if we just had to lend from banks, there's not enough money in those banks to actually do that, right? So the fact that the, that we can go buy houses and, and put, have trillions of dollars in liquidity, that's though those people who are providing that liquidity are not the boogeyman. None of the bad guys are providing liquidity, right? And the consumers are not the bad guys. The friction. The problem is there's a lot of friction in the market and. And I think the people who are getting paid and want to keep that friction there are probably the boogeymen, are probably the ones that are the, the if there has to be a, a white hat and a black hat, well, that's probably the black hat or the bad guys, you know, that, um, uh, I use this little Western movie analogy, but you know what I'm saying, that it, it's, it's those people that are holding on to what they've done and they're going to prevent market transformation that is the big sucking noise for that market transformation is coming from the consumers and from those folks who want to provide the liquidity then i i think those are the ones that i would target and say we, we you got to change right that's not the way it's going to be and it's getting it had to get forced in the real estate market and i mean when i say real estate market real, real estate brokerage market it had to get forced and hopefully it doesn't have to get forced in our market. We can just, we can change ourselves. I, I love this market is a great market, you know? And so it's, it's, uh, providing, providing a real, uh, there's Rick Grant. I know Rick, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and he's he, right. New tools came out. Um, but they, they went away because the new tools were built by uh, the airline industry. And here's here's what's you see that we talked about healthcare. I think my, uh, Michael brought it up. Well, the insurance companies did exactly what the travel agents were trying to do. They they intermediated between the healthcare providers and the consumer. Back when I went to the doctors when I was a kid, my mom just paid the doctor, you know, out of pocket. That was cash. You don't do that anymore. You paid the insurance company. I wonder if you added all the money you paid for insurance or your company you paid for insurance money could go to you as compensation over a lifespan and how much money that the medical service provider got all, all of them combined. I think obviously there'd be a big gap between that. And that gap is the money wasted because they got intermediated. Right. And Michael and I over dinner thought about how many people are getting a, a, uh, commission on just the sell of a house, you know, realistically the realtor, of course, and that the, uh, 
the uh, the loan broker, but those are the person who sells title, the person who sells you know the uh, uh, mortgage insurance keeps on going. The person who's trading makes a commission on that that uh, loan pool, right? It just keeps on going. There's a lot of commissions being based on. That. There is in that bubble. I think somebody looked at it and said, just as the price of homes keep rising, we got one final um, question with a nice segue for you, Dane. To thank you for coming on here. Um, Rick Brandt wrote, travel agents disappeared because new tools did a better job of serving buyers halfway or more through the buyer's journey. Agents and brokers work at the end of their typical consumer's home buying journey. Risky. How can they move their efforts to earlier in the journey? Can they? And while you're thinking of this answer, I just came from the AI summit and the biggest take, one of the biggest takeaways I heard from the UWM CIO, Jason, who is unbelievable, is now is the time to start over with your data. You have just bad data in, bad data out, years of data. Clean it up. Like now is the time to clean up the AI. There's AI out there. I say that because it's very consumer journey, um, top of funnel relevant. Can you answer this question while saying why bringing in you know, a group like you and other CIOs might be a better way to, to tackle these big con- Elephants just pick, picking a vendor and hoping they will solve something that hasn't been solved yet. Yeah, if I had a little boutique uh, store on in a, uh, uh, a strip mall and I was selling baby clothes, infant clothes, and I was selling those clothes, baby clothes, and making whatever you know the two hundred thousand dollars a year in my whole, and I had employees, I would sell construction loans or, or you know, residential construction loans or even mortgages. And the reason I would do that is because that's a life event change and because somebody's coming in because they're having a baby and they're trying to, or somebody that they know is going to have a baby. And usually those people have to buy a new house or, or home or put a, a, do a remodel or put another house, uh, another room on there. And I would look at that, that transaction, just like George Sewell would. And I would, I would find opportunities to concierge around those big lifestyle events, uh, life changing events, those life events. That's where all the marketing is going right now. And you can do that yourself. So I think, I think, uh, uh, brokers, if they, again, what are you doing here? If you're helping these consumers out, then you can, you're helping them out with what is the, what is that consumer buying baby clothes want? They want to have a baby. They just need more room. They just need all, they need ornament. They need all these other things. All they really care about is the loving, the love and, and care for this child that's coming into their life. That's all they care about. Help them with that. Help them with that. That's what I say. Thank you, Dane. We appreciate you coming on. Any final thoughts, Mike? I actually have other questions, but we can go on in an hour if I start asking because they're going to go deep. <laughs> Maybe another time. We'll do it another time. We'll then, go yeah. to www.mikedupshow.com to send this to your friends to listen. Uh, if you're watching on video, forward it to somebody. It, it's definitely great. And if you follow us on anything that sounds like Spotify or Google, uh, YouTube, please uh, a subscribe really helps us get more sponsors so we can bring on more amazing guests and, and show them why this is the number one weekly show where the audience can participate. And with that said, thank you, Rick Grant, for that question. And see you guys next Sunday on the podcast drop. And for those live, Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern. And of course, at 11 a.m. Pacific. Thank you, Dane.